don't worry, I'm not going to try and teach you anything because you all know much more about this than I do. This is just to give you some overview on risk um, and to put everything into context. Is that working? Here we go. These are the aims that I was given um, when trying to organise the SDO portion. The one that I'm really keen on is the sharing national practices. Um, it's a busy programme, especially today, uh, so if we have to start to squeeze down on the coffee breaks, I apologise. But we've got 22 speakers from nine nations over the next, well, two, two half and one day, sort of two days in total, um, which I think gives us a great opportunity to go through, to compare and contrast how we go about the same issue of aeromedical risk assessment. And the idea here is that we may think we've got it right. We may have done something one way you know, forever in a day, but maybe somebody's got a better idea. Maybe there's something we can learn that we can take back to adapt, to improve our practice, to gain commonality, not because somebody from on top tells us we have to, but because we as the operators realise there's a better way of doing it. A few thank yous to start off with. I couldn't but thank Mark Copewell for all his immense hard work, not only organising the European Flight Surgeons bit, but also in being the local contact for the STO portion. Without Mark and his team, none of this would be happening. In fact, last week, only a week ago, I was speaking to Mark and he said, it may have to be cancelled because of the cliff. It's going to have to be cancelled because of the cliff. How can that be? What has Cliff Richard got against flight surgeons? And then he explained, and literally, it's only his hard work last week defending this means that we're all sitting here um, at the moment. So for me, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> then there's Ron and his team behind the scenes. Um, also Ulrich, for whom you've all had a very good lunch, and another one uh, coming tomorrow, and Jerome, both in the audience. Um, Ed, bless him, is, um, I'm subletting to Ed tomorrow for the cardiology bit. Um, all of the speakers, thank you very much for giving up your time, not only to, to write the lectures, but to present, uh, and to do all that hard drinking of beer we had to do uh, last night at Mark's house. Everyone else who I've forgotten to mention, this is getting to the Oscars now, isn't it? I'm really, really emotional about this. Um, and also to the base commander for hosting the event. There we go. Is risk worth taking? Well, yes. People like this. And I have to say, isn't that a fine figure of an aviator? Isn't that what you want your aviators to look like? Bernard Lynch, the first live ejection from a jet aircraft, led indirectly, because it's a different maker seat, to events like this. So yes, risk can be worth taking. What does that actually mean? It means different things to all of us. So I'm going to give you the UK definition that we use. Um, we've heard a different definition of risk earlier. I'm not saying we've got it right, but it's one way of thinking about it. We talk about hazard as being something with the potential to cause harm, and risk as the probability of harm occurring. The key word there is probability. It's all about probability assessments. So, if you've got a hungry tiger, that is a hazard. However, if the tiger is sitting behind bars in a zoo, I suggest that's a low risk. But if you're wandering through the Borneo jungle and you come face to face with this, maybe that's a high risk. They're all tigers. Why do we bother doing aeromedical risk evaluation? Well, quite simple, we want to take the hazard via a process of risk eva um, evaluation to our aeromedical um, decision. We get there via different routes in different countries. To give an example, and I'll probably be shot down in flames by my American counterparts here, for the American system, it's the illness that stops you flying. The doc lets you go back flying by giving you a waiver. Great, the doc is your friend. Maybe you can't get back flying, but that's the illness's fault, not the docs. The UK system, for the same illness, it's the doctor that downgrades you. Maybe you have the same restrictions, but the doc's taken something away. We all get to the same place, and that's recognised in the fact we have a STANAG. Interoperability, we all recognise each other's standards, the way we go about assessing it, but we all get there via different routes. They're valid because they work for our, our, our national way of working. For me, 
this is what it's all about. This is my sort of personal mantra, to keep aircrew flying safely as long as possible. Bit of a no-brainer, the aircrew don't mind it either. Well, certainly the first bit, keep aircrew flying, very happy. As long as possible, very happy. The one we occasionally have problems with is safely. Just as an aside, if you Google happy aircrew, you find lots and lots of happy aircrew. If you Google grumpy aircrew, you find two, and that's one of them. Is that telling us something about aviators' attitude towards life? Um, our aeromedical risk evaluation is only part of the whole. I'm not trying to say that we, that we own the whole of the risk. We've got the other things that we all know about there. What we're interested in, though, is the common one we talk about is the risk of sudden incapacitation putting flight safety at risk. Um, the single seat jet jock who if he has a sudden incapacitation event, the show's over, the fat lady's sung, all the bad stuff's happened. We've also though got the risk to the mission, maybe he's a chap down the back, largely unregarded, but he's mission critical and sudden incapacitation stops him from doing the job, stops the mission from completing. And we're also interested in risk assessing those guys and coming up with the right assessment for them. So how do we classify risk? I'm just putting up a few thoughts. We've got absolute versus relative. You often find the press get really wound up about relative risk. This has got three times the risk of that, but three times of nothing is still nothing. Aircrew will key into that. What we're really interested in is the absolute risk. Fixed risk versus variable risk. Okay, I have a fixed risk because I'm a bloke. That uh, leads to a risk of heart disease. It's something that maybe I could do something about, but frankly the surgery does not appeal. Um, there is a variable risk, I'm obese. I could do something about that. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. That's a variable risk. Um, I must admit, hearing Ron talk about his bit, I was thinking, this is getting a bit close to the bone. Um, acceptable versus unacceptable. We'll come back to that in two ticks. Known versus unknown risk. We're getting into the Rumsfeldian uh, unknown unknowns here. There are some risks that we don't know about yet because we haven't spotted them. There's a number of members of this audience um, who have operated in chambers above 20,000 feet on more than 50 runs who have suddenly become aware of a new risk. <laughs> it's been talked about. <laughs> There's a research project coming on. But some of the unknown unknowns, some things you just can't prepare for. <laughs> I think what we're about is trying to assess the absolute risk, trying to minimise the variable risk, and then to inform those who need to know about the remaining risk, to let them make a decision about what's acceptable. We don't own that because, and I'll talk about later, context is important here. It's not us to turn around to the operators and say, this risk is too high, this risk is too low. We should help them understand what level of risk they're carrying and let them make that decision. Thinking about unknown risks, has anyone been eating any of these recently? Because that's all beef, isn't it? <laughs> and then there's risk mitigation. If we know that there's a hazard out there, to give a real world example, and somebody warns us about it, and somebody gives us information on what to do, then there's something we can do about it. Although from yesterday's talk, I suspect ABC is a far, far safer um, way to approach that subject. I'm going to have to step behind this so I can, uh, can read the numbers here. Um, UK risk um, stats. Annual risk of smoking. Yeah, that's fair enough. We can all deal with that. Um, a lot of smokers don't seem to listen to that one. How do we communicate these as meaningful figures to people, though? You look at... Um, winning the UK national lottery. 70% of the UK population play the lottery every week. 94% have played it at some time. 80 million tickets are bought every week. It goes up by 50 million on a big rollover. That's an awful lot of people who think they can win the lottery, yet they're not worried about being struck by lightning. <laughs> if they were, we would see more of this French invention <laughs> around the British streets. I'm also fascinated if anyone's ever come across anyone who's phobic about mattresses and pillows because they realise they're an even bigger risk. 
Aviators are aware that what they do is risky. They've got sayings for it. So they know the job they do is hazardous. They know there's a risk. <coughs> right, time for you to try out your clickers. The question, would you go flying with this man? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a range of answers. <laughs> We'll just bring it up. You can try your clickers so we can, we can prove the experiment here. While this is coming up, the idea behind the questions at the start and finish of, uh, of each lecture is so that you can show that you've learned something from the pearls cast before you um, by the lecturers. Um, it's a good sort of CME type thing. It worked well last year. Hopefully we'll get into, into the swing of it uh, as the years go on, as the, uh, as the day goes on. Um, just padding out a bit tight. Oh, here we go. Right. Are we open? Can we vote? Vote away. It's good to vote quickly on this. I'm not going to go back and ask this question uh, answer. I know one person that's putting yes. <laughs> <laughs> but while you're voting, do any of the following things alter your opinion? Well, most of you are probably aware of that. Does that make you more or less nervous? Yeah, but actually, he's not bad company in club class when he allows me to visit him. Um, so context is key to what we define as acceptable or unacceptable risk. What might be acceptable on one day, have you got the answers for that? Or? Oh, go on then. Shall we see what they said? Oh, yes! <laughs> People actually said, yeah, good Lord, never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. The clickers are working. Excellent. So, to think about context again, these are all good things, aren't they? Or are they? It depends on the context. Right. A video, because we've got to show you a video. And you've got to have some rolling stones.
So, they know it's risky. How do we communicate what we mean by risk then? Because I'm sure we've all come across. It doesn't apply to me, Doc, because I've got a friend who, insert they were condition, what restrictions they were given here. We need something like this, something like micromorts. This is standardizing your risk probability into the risk of death of one in a million. Here you go, some micromorts. How far can you travel for one micromort? Or perhaps, more usefully, for 100 miles, how many micromorts does it cost you? Just a thought here to my European colleagues in the audience. Americans, bless them. They have a love affair with a motor car, don't they? Sometimes we've been a bit cruel and callous, and we've thought that maybe it's because they're lazy. It's not. It's because they understand risk. That's why. <laughs> but suddenly you've got a way that you can communicate absolute risk in an understandable, relative way that gets through to air crew. I couldn't find any for flying an F-16 or anything like that. These are just pulled off the web. Another interesting one here. The older you get, the riskier it is to get out of bed. <laughs> I think that's a great excuse. There we go. Putting that into a military context in micromorts, somebody has done some work on that and looked at this. So you can turn around to your British squaddy and tell him what his risk of being out on the ground in Afghanistan is and how that relates to if he was in the UK. That's me done. We've got questions at the end in a panel session. I'm going to suggest we try and keep them for that because when we get the questions at the end, it's your time and you can then titrate your thirst for knowledge against your thirst for beer and decide how long you wish to keep going. So unless anyone's got any particularly pressing ones, I'd like to invite Brigadier General Jex back to the stage. I won't try and introduce him because Colonel Cokewell did so much better job the other day and I've just embarrassed myself. <laughs>